that's the main feature of asymmetric cryptography is that we have a public key and a private key. Uh, so the public or others will, if they want to send that, to send us messages in a secure way, they will encrypt them using the public key and we can decrypt them using the private key. Um, so in here, what we really want to emphasize, uh, one of the algorithms that is being used to do asymmetric encryption, the most famous and the most widely used one is RSA. So we'd like to see how the encryption and decryption is done, what is the algorithm to do so, and also the public and the private key, how do we generate it? So this is where, this is the focus of this session. Um, so this is just to remind you, like in uh, asymmetric cryptography, the reason why we call it asymmetric, because we have two keys, public key and a private key. Um, this is one way of using it, is to encrypt and decrypt, but this is not, in reality, we don't use it this way, as we discussed. In reality, we use, the, we use a hybrid approach, where um, the, the asymmetric cryptography is only used to establish a shared key. We use it to establish a shared key by, uh, let's say, for example, in here, Alice will use the public key public key, and she will use it to encrypt a shared key. She will encrypt it, send the encrypted key, and then Bob will receive the encrypted key, decrypt it, and then they will both have exchanged securely uh, the shared key. Follow once the key is established using asymmetric cryptography, then we switch to symmetric, symmetric cryptography such as AES or DAS, and we use the shared key to, to exchange secure messages. So this is how it is used in practice. Uh, what's the reason of having this hybrid approach? Yes, because of performance, because this one is slow, relatively slow, sometimes thousand times slower than the symmetric one. That's why in, real, in, in practice we have this hybrid approach. The other use case, this is the first use case of asymmetric cryptography. The second use case is we use it for digital signature, as I explained last time, where the sender will encrypt using the private key and the recipient will decrypt using the public key. In this case, we're not trying to achieve confidentiality, rather we're trying to achieve integrity and non-repudiation and authenticity of the message coming from uh, uh, a, a trusted source. So this is more just to bring the idea closer, but this is not really how we use symmetric, asymmetric cryptography in real world. We don't use it for exchanging uh, large messages or for encrypting and decrypting messages because it is slow. We, we mainly use it for key exchange and for digital signatures. That's what we will be discussing later on. So the first and the most important algorithm in, uh, for asymmetric cryptography is RSA. Uh, as I explained before, it was invented in 1977 by the three authors. Their first name is, this, this is the first letter of their first name. And the key idea of RSA is this one-way function. It relies on this one-way function. And the, the one-way function selected by RSA is factorization of large integers. And this is the simple idea visually how it looks. So if you take two numbers, prime numbers, two large prime numbers, it is very, very easy to compute their product. And this will give you M, which is the product of both numbers. But given M, if you want to, factor, uh, to do factorization and find out what, what were the prime numbers used, this, this is a very hard problem. There is no well-known efficient solution to do this, especially for large numbers. So that's what uh, RSA relies on in terms of security. So on this, the inverse of the factorization, the, the inverse of product of products or multiplication is factorization. This inverse happens to be very, very hard. So if I give you a number like this and ask you to find what are the two prime numbers used to produce this number, 
this is not an easy problem to, to be solved. Okay, so that's the, the, the core of the, uh, of the RSA algorithm, this one-way function. Okay, now for the encryption and decryption algorithm, um, those are the formulas, very easy to, to compute. So if we want to encrypt, what I do is I take the message I want to encrypt, raise it to the power of E mod N. So this E and N are two numbers. The, prime, the public key is made up of two numbers, N and E. N is, we use it for the modulus, and E, we use it to raise the message to that, to that power. Uh, so that's basically how the encryption works. Decryption, surprisingly, exactly the same formula, except in here, instead of using E, we use D. This is the private key. So we take the ciphertext and we raise it to the power of D modulus N. And that's it, we get the decrypted value. Um, and by the way, D, this number here, D and N, are very large integers, hundreds of digits long. Uh, so the minimum should be 1,024 bits. But in reality, like the recommended is at least 2,048 or even more. That's, that's basically um, what the key is made up of. The key is made up, the public key is made up of two numbers, N and E, and the private key, although we are, we are focused on D, but really it has D and same N. So the, the mode that we use, the, the N we use to do the modulus is the same for public key and private key. The only difference is really if we want to uh, highlight the difference is what we use for the exponent. For the encryption, we use E, and for decryption, we use D. Now, these two numbers are the inverse of each other, are the inverse of each other. Those E and D are not random numbers, definitely not random numbers. There is a well-defined algorithm to generate them. So every entity out there, they generate a a pair, this pair of two keys. They generate it. The, the public one, they make it available to everyone, and the private, they keep it, they keep it secret. That is the, the whole idea. And this is just a small, very small example here. Let's say I want to encrypt this number 88. All I do, I take the plain text and raise it to the power of E. This is my E, and this is my N. This is my D and this is my N. I take a plain text and raise it to the power of E mod N. It gives me this cipher text. I take it, send it to the recipient. The recipient will do exactly the same formula, except this time they will use D instead of E. They will use the private key. So they will take the cipher text, raise it to the power of D modulus N, and they will get back the plain text. That's basically the, how the encryption, decryption, straightforward, very simple formula. Uh, now, the last thing we need to learn is how we generate the key. This is the most uh, kind of a bit difficult part of the algorithm, um, of the RSA protocol and algorithm. Um, so what we do here, the output of the algorithm is what we want to produce at the end of the day. We want to produce the public key made up of N and E. N is the modulus and E is the exponent. And then we also want to generate the public, the private key, which is denoted here as D. So at the end of the day, this algorithm produces how many numbers? Three numbers, E, N, and D, okay? So this is the algorithm. This is what RSA uh, inventors came up with. So the first step is you take two large prime numbers. These are very big numbers. Uh, you select them. Prime means they are only divisible by, by one and by themselves. They are not divisible by any other number. Once you take, once you choose these prime numbers, what you, what's the second step? Multiply. Mul multiply them. So this prime number, let's denote them as P and Q. We do P times Q, it produces for us N. 
So we already computed the first of the three numbers that we need. N is now known. Here is N. So N is public. But because, remember, factorization is so hard, nobody can reproduce this P and Q using a large... I'm talking here about large numbers. Okay, this, the, the third step, we, produce, we compute this uh, value here called phi N. And how do we compute it? Is P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Uh, very simple. The, third, the fourth step is we select a public exponent. This is the E. So it is a, a number that, that has these properties. The first thing, this number must be greater than 1 and less than phi n. This is the first condition. The second condition is that it, sh it should not share any factor with phi n. It should... It should not be. Uh, it should not share any factor with phi, and I will explain what this means. Another way to to say this condition is is that the uh, greatest common divider, the greatest common divider between e and phi n is one, which means there is no other divider that can divide the two numbers except one. They they have no common divider, except one. So in English, this is how we say it. This E and phi do not share any factors. But mathematically, how we can express this in a nice way? We just say the greatest common divider between the E and phi n is 1. If we can prove if E is between 1 and phi n and, it, and the greatest common divider is 1, then E is a very good uh, choice. We have to choose it this way because we need to find the inverse of it. If, if, this, if this property is not satisfied, you cannot find the inverse. What I mean here by the inverse, look at this. Look at the formula here. Encryption, decryption is the inverse of the encryption. What is different between these two formulas here? They look exactly the same. What's the difference? Yeah. It's just the exponent. So this one must be the inverse, the D, Basically, D must be the inverse of E. That's why we select E carefully, because not every number will have an inverse. Like, we have to select it carefully. That's why when we select E, it must satisfy this condition. Yeah? It will become clearer with an example. I'm just trying to present this in an abstract way. So this one is still, up to here, is still, still easy easy steps. So the most crucial step is this one, where we compute D. So the way we compute D, we have to compute it in a way, in a way that D times E mod phi n equal 1. Okay? Now the math behind this, we are not diving into how these formula, uh, formulas are uh, kind of... Um, defined, there is a, not a bit complicated math behind it. Now we don't, uh, let's not dive into there. This is basically, D must satisfy this condition. And for, uh, to, to, for us, we need to solve this equation. We need to solve this equation for D. All other values are known. E is known at this stage, and phi n is known. The only thing is not known is D. So to solve this one uh, is nothing but to solve this, this equation can be mapped to this uh, well-known extended Euclidean algorithm equation. So what you do is the normal equation looks like this. The normal extended Euclidean algorithm equation looks like this. Ax plus By equal 1. I will explain what this all means. So in our in this RSA key generation algorithm, E maps to E. So basically you take the value of E, you, you, you place it in front of X, and, and the B maps to phi N. And then you solve this equation the, the way I will show you shortly. Okay? 
So this is in, in high level, like uh, th this is the details of the algorithm, but the last step is not clear. It will be clarified through an example. So let's go through, uh, go through this example step by step. Of course, we are taking small numbers for illustration, uh, but in real life, those are large, very large numbers. So, so what we have here, Bob wants to generate the private and public key. What is the first step of the algorithm? Choose, yeah, choose two large parameters. In this case, we selected P equal 3 and Q is equal 11. What is the second step? Yeah, compute the product and assign it to N. So N is P times Q, which is 33. So we already have the first number of the three numbers that we need. So N is 33. The third step, we compute this phi n, okay? So what is phi n? Is p minus 1 times q minus 1. In this case, 2 times 10, which is basically 20. Now, the fourth step is we have to select a value for e. It must be an odd number greater than 1. Here is the condition of e. It must be greater than 1, and it must be less than uh, phi n. Yeah? The second thing, if you remember, the greatest common divider between e and phi, and phi n must be equal to 1. Okay? So, we have 1. 1 is out of the question. We will not take it because it doesn't satisfy the first condition. 2, we don't take 2 because it's an even number. So the third, the candidate, the candidate number is 3, which is a, an odd number. We just need to verify whether the common denominator between 3 and, in this case, 20 is 1. Obviously it is, but let's go through the formula and just show you how this works. So what we want to do here, we want to say what is the common the greatest common divider between E, what is E here? 3 and 20. We want to verify whether it is really equal to 1. That's what we want to, to verify for us to make the right choice. We have to make the right choice of E for us to be able to compute uh, D. If you don't make the right choice, it means the right choice means it meets these two conditions then we, have, we will have a problem computing D. So let's go through and just see how this common, uh, greatest common divider works. It uses the Euclidean uh, algorithm, which is a 2,300 years old algorithm. It's very old algorithm, very, very widely used, surprisingly very widely used algorithm. So here it is. So this is the greatest common divider between E and phi n, which happens to be the greatest common divider between 3 and 20. So this is how we go about it. We take the largest number of the two. Which one is the largest number? Of course, 20. Then we say, which equal to the smallest number, which is 3, and we ask ourselves, how many threes we have in 20? Yeah? And most likely, they might be some reminder R. So if we come back here and say, how many threes in 20? So we have six, six threes. And six times three is 18. What's the remainder? Two. Yeah. The second step is basically we kind of do a left, a left shift. So this value takes the place of 20 and this remainder takes the place of, thir of 3. So as we, if we say, okay, let us express 3 in terms of 2. How many, how many 2s we have in 3? 1, yes? And the remainder is 1. Yeah? Okay, good. Now, what's the next step? Same thing. We shift. 
same idea we shift these so we will express two in terms of one how in terms of one how many ones we have in two two and what's the remainder zero so once we arrive to zero we go back one step and the remainder of the previous step is the actual greatest common divider you can do this with small numbers, with big numbers. You follow this algorithm, it will give you the greatest common divider. What is the greatest common divider? 3 and 20 equal 1. Is our condition satisfied? The condition that RSA set for E, is it satisfied? Yes. So 3, is 3 between uh, greater than 1 and less than 20? Yes is uh, the greatest common divider between uh, E between 3 and 20 equal to 1? Yes, we just went through the, this algorithm and we proved it. Yes, please. No, you choose any of them. Like, for example, if we change uh, any of them, like 3, 5, 7, all of them will be this condition. But for us, just to keep it simple, we choose, in this case, 3. Okay. So as long as you select something in this range that follow this condition, we are fine. Any of them will, will do. Yeah? Any of them. So I can go and select seven, five, uh, all of five, is it? No, five will not work, sorry. Five because it's, it, has a, it has a common divider between 20 and five. So seven should be okay. Nine, 11, 13, and so on. So it's, with... For, for to keep it simple, we selected third. I mean, the algorithm will go to the smallest number and check, then choose the first one that satisfies. Or um, okay, it doesn't really say so, but this is a good question. What I want to say here, this is kind of the out of the box algorithm, how the RSA uh, kind of defined it, how RSA authors defined it. Now, in terms of realistic implementation. In terms of realistic implementation, there, is, there are much more kind of sophisticated way to implement this uh, rather than the out of the box. So once, uh, like, let's say someone puts the seeds, then a lot of research and development follows to give more sophisticated ways of computing and computing all these numbers. And maybe some guidance, some further guidance, what is the best way to choose E, is it the smallest, is it something in the middle, is it something towards the, the end of the range? Those are practical implementation concerns that you can find guidance in other literature. Uh, so this is just for us, we're just trying to bring the idea a bit closer to our, our mind, that uh, the main key idea is that these two numbers are not random, there is some algorithm behind them to generate them. Um, now, this is the kind of the simplest way to present this uh, and to kind of practice it. But in terms of realistic implementation, there is much more to it. There are more sophisticated ways of, of implementing the algorithm. There are implementation details uh, that we are omitting here. And this is true for most algorithms. What I mean, somebody come up with, you'll have the uh, kind of the Ummahat papers, and then you will have so many others that come to add some incremental improvement. Incremental improvement in terms of speed, incremental improvement in terms of ease of, uh, especially speed, ease of, uh, in this case, the main criteria is the speed. Like, a lot of uh, attempts tries to make it much faster than the original algorithm. Without, of course, the essence of the original algorithm is still there, just some further implementation details added by others uh, that follow the main, uh, the seed work. Okay, so the last step is D. We need to compute D. Uh, so we need to compute a D. In a way, we need to compute a D in a way that satisfies this equation here. So, which is basically uh, D in our case is the only unknown. E, we already computed it. What was E? Is 3. Mod phi n is 20 equal to 1. 
Yeah. Now, it's, this formula might sound, might seem very simple to pro, to compute, but it, it it's not. It's not simple to compute. So you need to map it. So one way, sometimes you will find in uh, in in general in the research and development, because remember these ideas initially. They are in the area of research. These people that invented this, they were in university, MIT University. So in, in the research, when you confront some problem, you first try to go back to previous works, what other people have done, and try to see if there is a solution. And you map your problem to an existing problem, and you use the solution of an existing problem, rather than reinventing the wheel. Yeah? So that's what these people did. So they said, okay, to solve this one, all you need to do is map it to an extended Euclidean algorithm. So let's, let's just take a look at this one. So the general algorithm says, if you remember there, the gen what did the general algorithm say? Ax plus Bx, By, yes, equals greatest common divider between A and B. Yes? Okay, so in here, the way we map this, the way we map this, E is mapped to E. A, sorry, A is mapped to E. And B is mapped to phi N. Now, if we, if we, uh, if we were in, in our concrete example, let's rewrite this for our concrete example. So in our concrete example, what is E? 3. So 3x, yeah, plus by, which is 20. 20y equals, what is the greatest common divider between E and phi n? Yes? One. By the way, that's why we put this condition in the first place. Because for us to, to uh, for us to find the D, D only exists if the greatest common divider between E and phi N is one. If it's not one, you cannot compute D. Like one way to solve it, or one common way to solve it, is to use the extended Euclidean algorithm. What this extended Euclidean algorithm says, Ax plus B, By equal the greatest common divider of A and B. That's it, yeah? So you take, so this is what, uh, let's say, um, RSA people did. Here is the problem they have. Here is a known problem with a known solution. So they mapped their problem to a known problem so they can get the solution. They don't want to break their head. There is a solution already. So once they take this formula, they plug in their own values. So they mapped A to what? E. e. And they mapped B to phi N. And then at the end, it becomes, really, it becomes EX plus phi NY equals the greatest common divider of E and, and uh, phi N. And the greatest common divider between E and phi N is 1. We, call, we have E equal to 3, yes? And we had uh, phi N equal to 20. And we want to compute D, what is the value of D, such that D times E mod phi N equals 1, yes? Just to double check this. Yes. Okay. Now, so this, uh, as we just discussed, this can be mapped to extended Euclidean algorithm. In a way, we can say it in, an, in a nice way, EX plus uh, phi N Y equals 1. Yeah? So in our case, in our case is 3X plus 20Y equals 1. Okay, to solve this one, we need to use extended Euclidean algorithm. 
So what is this extended Euclidean algorithm? It has two steps. The first step is you do what? You compute the greatest common divider between 3 and 20. How do we produce this great, uh, greatest common divider? We just did it before. So how we do, how we do this? So we'll say, what is the highest number is 20? Equals the small number. How many times we have 3 in 20 plus some remainder? Plus some remainder R. Yeah? So we will say here uh, 3 times 6, yes, plus 2. Then this one moves left, this one moves to its place. And then we have 3 equals what? 2 times times 1 plus 1. We are trying to do the extended Euclidean algorithm. We just need to stop at this stage. Okay? We stop at this stage where uh, the remainder is 1. We don't need to go all the way where the remainder is 0. Yes? So we stop here where the remainder is 1. And then this is basically the first step which is the Euclidean algorithm. And then we do, to solve this equation, we do backward substitution. Backward substitution. What this backward substitution means, well, let's, let's give it a try. So we take this formula and we try to express one. We try to compute one based on the other values. So one here is equal to what? Three. Yes? Minus 2, 1. Yeah? Okay, now, then you see this 2 here. Uh, we want to say it is 2. So what we can do here, I can say here 1 is equal 3. It will be 2. If I want to replace this, I replace 2, express it in terms of 20 minus 3, 6, yeah? So it will be what? So basically 20 minus 3 multiplied by 6. The whole thing times 1, yeah? So basically I replace 2 with the value of 2 expressed in terms of the previous uh, equation in the, uh, in the Euclidean algorithm solution. And this one can be expressed as 3 minus 20. And this one, if I multiply this one with this one, will be what? Plus, yeah? Plus 3, 6. Yeah? Uh, here, times 1, it will be the same. Like 20 times 1 is 20. Uh, minus 3, 6 times 1 is minus 3, 6. So, so far, what we have here, 1 equals... Uh, 3. So, what else we have here? Yep. Okay, so let me see. So, what we have here is... Uh, so, this one, 3 plus 3 times 6 is nothing but 3 times 7 minus 20. Yes. If you compare these two equations, you can see that... Uh, so, 3 here is the same as this factor here, 3. So a value of x that will satisfy this formula is basically, if we set, if we set x to 7, if we set x to 7, and this one maybe, uh, let's say, times 1. Um, so let's just plug the number here. So 3 times 7, 20, 21, plus uh, minus 20, is what? Is 1. Yeah? So basically, minus 20 here, basically, as, as we are doing here plus, and here, if, look, if you take a look here, as if I'm doing here minus 1. So y, what is the value of y? Is minus 1. What we really care about is really x, because in this formula, we have d times e mod uh, phi n, which... The only, uh, the only uh, unknown that we care about is d. So d in this case is equal to 7. 
So if we plug 7, it, this formula is uh, satisfied. Not only this, let's try it in this other co condition that we put up. So what we have here, what is the value of D? 7. What is the value of E? 3. So 7 times 3 mod 20 equal 1. And that's basically using the extended Euclidean algorithm we can solve this. So let me show it show it this way. Maybe it's be a bit more clear. Uh, so to compute D, we have to use extended Euclidean algorithm. And this extended Euclidean algorithm it allows us to compute x and y. So here is. Uh, and the, here is the general formula that we got from Wikipedia. Ax plus by equals uh, greatest common divider a and b, yes? Now, a is mapped to e, and b is mapped to phi n. So what we do here, at the end of the day, we need to solve this equation, which is ex plus phi n equals phi n y equals 1. So e and phi n, we already know them, so we plug our numbers here. So at the end of the day, this is the equation we need to solve. So this equation can be solved using the extended Euclidean algorithm, which, ha which has two steps. What is the first step? Is we do the Euclidean algorithm. What the Euclidean algorithm really allows us to do, it allows us to compute the common, the greatest common divider. So we say, we at the first step is we compute the greatest common divider of these factors, 3 and 20. And uh, the way we do it, I explained it before, we take the greatest number and we try to express it in terms of the small number. So in this case, we have six threes in 20, and the remainder is 2. And then we, we kind of do a lift shift. Um, so 3, three comes to, uh, let me see, 3 comes to the left, and then 2 comes to the place of 3. Yeah, And then I'll express 3 in terms of 2. So in 3, there is 1, 2, plus 1. So at this stage, because I'm doing the extended Euclidean algorithm, I can stop at the stage where the remainder is 1. And then I do with back substitution. I start from the final result and work my way backward. So in here, what I'm doing, I'm expressing... What I'm doing here, I'm expressing 1 in terms of the other, the other values. So I... I move this one to the right, or re basically rewrite this formula to, to say 1 equal 3 minus 1, 2, yeah? And then here, this uh, coefficient here, or this value here, I replace it with its uh, corresponding value from the previous equation. So 2, how do I express 2? I can express it as 20 minus 6, 3. So I replace 2 with it. I don't go ahead and compute the value. That's not what I'm interested in. I keep, I keep the factorization as it is. Like I, I express the values in terms of other values. And keep those expressions. Don't try to solve the, the values. Uh, that, because that's not what we want to achieve. Okay, so I keep replacing. And you can see here, when I replace this, this will become, because this one is minus, times minus 6, 3, it becomes plus. So this will become uh, plus 6 times 3. And you can see here, 3 plus 6 times 3 is 7 times 3. So I'll express it this way, 7 times 3. And this 20 becomes minus 1 times 20. That's how we express it. So at the end of the day, if you look at these formulas, so here is 3, which is known to me. Here is 20, which is known to me. What, I, what this extended Euclidean algorithm allows me to compute, it allowed me to nicely compute that. So x and y. So the x is 7, and the y is, in this scenario, minus 1. Yeah? Now, I just find out the uh, 7 is the value of d, basically. 
um, because if you look at the original formula, if you look, if you remember, the original formula was what e times d, yeah, mod phi n equal one. That was the original formula. So really, this first part, this first part, the unknown here is d. So, because x is mapped to d, x is mapped to d. I just didn't want to express it here as E d because we took the formula as it is from the extended Euclidean algorithm. The extended Euclidean algorithm it expresses the problem as a x plus b x equal one, or equal uh, greatest common divider of between a and b. Yeah. So I hope it is it is clear. So. Basically, it is very simple. You just need to do a bit of practice. So I provided here a couple of examples with the final solution. Please go ahead and do it manually because this is very important to get a little bit of experience with this. Also, I found another example on the... On the I found another example on YouTube. Here is the problem and the solution. And you have a full explanation there. And I will also post my own explanation. So by now, it's... The, 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 how the key generation work should be very clear and you should be able to do it in a simple example by yourself. That, that. And this will conclude this lesson. So next time we will be seeing hashing and digital signature. Um, so that's the summary of the, of the whole lecture. So RSA is the most widely used public key encryption. Uh, it's mainly used, as I explained, for e key exchange and digital signature, not for encryption and decryption. Uh, it relies on factorization, factorization of two prime numbers. Factorization of a number to find the original prime numbers is very, very hard, and the security of RSA relies on factorization. So currently, uh, 1,024 bits key cannot be factored using the current technology and the current uh, computation power. Um, and we can reach there according to predictions. We can Computing power will get there in 10 to 15 years. That's why it is much safer to use RSA with even a bigger key to give much hard time to brute force attackers. This one is very secure. If you take RSA key with 2048 or 3076, it's much more secure. But of course, less efficient. More, it takes more time to encrypt and decrypt. So that's the summary. So next time we will be focusing on hashing and digital signature, and that will be the last topic of the cryptography.